So as it says, I'm Ed uh, from U.S. Airways, and I'm going to do just a little bit different power and gave you this morning with Southwest Airlines. Uh, we're actually a Zykus user, so I'm going to inject that into the, uh, the briefing today. And as, as the announcer said, I came from Boeing for 30 years. Uh, Howard Hughes' his company, uh, Hughes Helicopters, I, I worked there since 1979. Commercial military helicopters with them. McDonald was bought them in 1984. So then I was McDonald Douglas for a long time. And then 97, Boeing and McDonald Douglas merged. So I had the opportunity to work with you know three great pioneers of the aerospace industry. And I've been with U.S. Airways for three years now. And I, I got to tell you, I know everybody's from the procurement side. The airlines is a lot different than, say, an aerospace company or any regular company. And you'll, you'll see why when I get to that. So today I'm going to talk about uh, what I think is important. I've got four key messages for everybody here today. We can use all the tools and people and processes we want. But if we don't have an in-depth knowledge of who our customer is and what industry you're in, it's going to be hard for you to provide a good return as a procurement organization. So that's a key message I want to talk to you about today. We'll talk about delivering value through people, processes, and tools. We all know that's important. I'll share with you kind of where we are in our journey in doing that with a special emphasis on the tools. Understanding the enabling power of your spend analysis some of you who may have sat in the OSIF uh, room just here a little while ago, OSIF did a really nice job talking about how the tool has helped us, some of the challenges getting started up with the Zykus tool, culture changes for the company, getting buy-in. I'll spend a little bit of time on that. I'll actually show you some results that we've gotten from the tool. Even We started uh, August of 2011 using the Zykus tool, the eye analysis and the e-sourcing, and I'll talk to you about some of our, our results and with some of our customers. And then the last one is, our, we have a desired end state for corporate purchasing. It's real simple, and, and I'll get into that. So those are the key messages for today. Um, first, you know, how many of you guys flew in on an airplane? Show of hands. <laughs> right? Okay. And, and I did say that the airline business is, is a different animal. I'm going to show you why in a second. So I want to spend a little time just educating you about the airline industry. Uh, a little overview about who we are at U.S. Airways, what we're doing to re-engineer the procurement function, we have a desired end state and, and then how we're delivering value, putting all those things together. So the airline industry starts with capacity management. You all fly on an airplane and you don't really think about things, but what we do for an airline, we transport people, we transport cargo. So those are those two big things we do in the industry. So, so that's one line. The ancillary revenue, that's where we make money off of you guys on baggage buy on board products, things like that, duty free, so that's another big piece of the airline business. Consolidation, I'll show you that in a minute. You've all heard about mergers and acquisitions, and a lot of your companies have been through that as well. I'll show you what the airline has done uh, from a U.S. Airways perspective. And then no matter what we do, fuel makes up a good 30% of our cost. So we don't hedge fuel. We have an organization that manages our fuel and fleet department, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But we don't control 30%. That, that's the fuel industry. And so we, we go up or down based on that for the fuel. And U.S. Airways uh, has done very well the last year or so from an earnings perspective. And I'll show you some data. And then the last one, which is one of the more important ones, is the experience in the cabin. You know, when you, when you get in an airplane, whether you're flying first class, business class, you want to have that good experience because you're crowded with all the customers out there. And uh, how many remember the days where you got free food and <coughs> peanuts and things like that, right? Now you're lucky if you get water to soda. And we're trying to change that. The procurement group is really trying to change that so we can, we can get you guys a lot of that free product again. But, but it's a tough economy out there, especially with that fuel up. It's really hard to do some things. But we do offer some good, good food that we do, on loads that we do sell. So let's talk about the, I talked about consolidation. So U.S. Airways, if you look at the top left, uh, we started off as All American Airlines in 1939, and it was quickly changed over to Allegheny. But this was a small little airline that delivered mail from Pennsylvania and Ohio. That's how the company started. And then you can see the mergers all the way throughout. People earlier talked about PSA. I think it was uh, Howard <laughs> talking about that. We had a short little stint with Donald Trump, not one of his prouder moments. That didn't last very much, maybe a year and a half or so. 
And then uh, we actually became US Airways in 1996. The big merger with America West was uh, May of 2005. The good news for me, I had miles on both, both companies. So when I worked at Boeing, I was putting 200,000 miles a year. So I was a chairman flyer. So from my view, you know, I've, I've been with a company that built airplanes. I've been a customer at a, at a, at a miles program who was always getting first class upgrades. Now I'm at the airlines trying to help them get, be successful and on the procurement side. So, so a little bit different perspective. And then, you know, obviously today, 2005, we're sitting here as US Airways. So that's kind of a quick history of the company. We're headquartered in Tempe, Arizona. If you didn't know that, that's our current headquarters. And so I want you to think about, if you look at the total daily flights, we have 3,197 flights a day. So think about the logistics involved in all those locations, all the stations, the fuel, the catering services, the amenities that you all use on the airplane, 3,100 3, plus a day we do that. So there's a lot of, lot of dynamics going on in that. We have roughly 32,000 employees in the company. You see how it breaks down with uh, pilots and flight attendants and maintenance and others. And we operate out of basically three hubs, Charlotte, Philly, and Phoenix, and we have Focus City in Washington, D.C. So just a little, little facts about the airline for you. <coughs> and hopefully it's like this to the, or the copy of the presentation. So we're looking good on a lot of our metrics and our stats. Uh, the top left, you know, our you know, departing on time, uh, we're, we're like number one through second quarter, uh, through May of this year. Um, all the financials are going the right way. I, like I said, we've done really well over the last year. And, and these are all important <coughs> metrics that are measured across all the big, big players like United and Delta and, and U US Air uh, is in there. And uh, we'll see what happens with American Airlines and you, you all know about that story. The, the message on these two slides on the left, it shows you kind of our pre-tax margin. And what that says for US Airways is 8.6 of every dollar we're making in revenue, we're able to put that back into the company and invest it where, wherever we think we need it, for the customers, for the products, for the services. So that's a positive sign going up for us. And you'll see on the revenue side, we've had a plus up in revenues for the last three years. So we're really doing well there. So the company's on the right track and we're really doing well. If we can get that fuel cost down, hopefully we can do something a lot better. Um, I think Austin may have mentioned this a little bit in the, in the panel session. We've got three types of procurement groups uh, that we, we kind of count at US Airways. There are a few other road groups out there that we didn't involve in this. But the left side is the fuel administration. Again, managing all of our fuel supply, our fleet administration, they, they focus on monitoring on that. The supply chain procurement, technical purchasing, do all the repairs, spare parts, the maintenance, things like that are done through a tech purchasing group. And they have a supply chain group built with inside, with, with inside that team. And I think uh, Oss has mentioned that if we can get some of our tools consistent in our processes, we want to be able to take our processes across to these other groups. So corporate purchasing is going to try to take the lead and develop all these new tools. And so on the far right is what we, what we cover for corporate purchasing. And you'll see there, it's, it's a, a laundry list of items that go anywhere from the aircraft appearance. So when you walk on an airplane, it needs to be clean, needs to be serviced, you know, one flight after another. Somebody comes on and cleans it and, and hopefully gives a good experience. <coughs> Same thing, you gotta reboard the catering, the food, all those things have to take place on the aircraft. Then we have a lot of other products, which, which I'll talk about. And just a snapshot. So you may not think about some of these things. If you look at the little bar there, you, you know when you get in line, those are called stances, I guess they're called. And we buy those, the signs to tell you where to go, the in-flight magazines, the in-flight entertainment. Uh, let's see, is Eric here? There's Eric back here. He does all of our food and beverage. And we have liquor laws that drive how we do liquor in different states when you're flying and have battles with that. So you just think about the dynamics. We have a, a club that we have to service and we have clubs in a lot of our locations. The, the food menus get refreshed every couple times a year on the menus and you have to deal with the caterers and, th and things like that. So a lot of dynamics. Okay, so what are we doing to change the procurement function? 
So I, I've got a few slides here I want to talk about. One is understanding the mess. I talked about the dynamics of an airline and how it's different and all the diverse products you have to deal with, the customers you have to deal with. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. You know, what, what our current state is, I'll show you where we are in our journey uh, and how we're teaching what I call the monster to change. The monster is our customers, our, our employees, the people at the company, um, and, and, and it's, a big, it's a big challenge out there. Where, where do we start? So where do we start in the organization to make that change? The sourcing strategy, you all have a, you've seen a lot of examples today of how people do their sourcing strategy. I'll share with you what ours is. And I'll tell you, we can't get, it's a six step process. We can't get past the first two gates without some kind of a sourcing tool. And I'll, and I'll show you why we're using Zykus so we can get past that gate. And then just make sure you're planning to execute project management, basically is what that's about. So, so this is a mess. So if you think about corporate purchasing, and this is just a taste, we could put, all of you could identify more blocks you could put on here. But we're right in the middle of people, processes, tools, skills, customers, bills of material. You saw all these sessions around here talking about contract management, databases. How do you how do you manage all those things? All those things go through purchasing. And when you have a company like U.S. Airways, and we're these we're a decentralized company. So we have we have everybody has their own little kingdoms and little organizations. Some of you might be familiar with that. And I've worked in both. I've worked where you've reported to a business unit and a functional lead, or just a business unit, or just a functional lead. And they're, and they're all different. It's all based on your processes, your controls. It'll work fine if you have those under control, but when you don't, you just, you just have a mess. And, and what I call, you unleash the mess, it just gets worse. Every customer, so the interfacing with all the customers just make it very difficult for us. And so this is the message I'm going around now for one of the new groups that I'm managing. Show, I showed them. Uh, we have a dining catering service uh, organization. I showed them a chart just like this, but it was just for the, one of their companies, and it was a catering company, and they have maybe 12, 15 catering contracts, and it gets even more involved because then you got laws, international laws, city, city laws, state tax laws, liquor laws, and so I showed them a chart similar to this, but it just gets very, very complicated. The message for the customer, the employees at US Airways, is you really do need to have good people, processes, and tools, and have it aligned across the company if you're going to make these things work. Otherwise, you're going to be dealing with this day in, day out, and we're just going to give everybody a headache. Okay, so the current state, how are we fixing these things? So the first on the left is about the people. I think Austin talked a little bit about this. Um, let's say I've been there three years. I'm the second longest tenured person in our organization in three years, okay? And that's because our customers didn't know who corporate purchasing was. They didn't know how corporate purchasing could help them. They didn't know we existed in a lot of cases. So what we did is we completely relooked at all of our skill sets. We have a lot of great folks coming out of the ASU supply chain schools of management. We've got some great, we have an intern program. So we, we have, what, four or five interns with the company. and. They're just super smart, and they work 20, 30 hours a week, and we've actually converted some of those to permanent time employees. And, and again, with great staff, so we re-engineered re that. You see the ethics is a, is a key thing for us. You have to have good procurement integrity, good ethics when you're working with your customers, your suppliers, as you all know, because it's just important, and you don't want to run into any legal issues. So that's what we're looking for for people. We've changed our recruiting processes. We've got engaged workforce, diverse workforce, and I don't mean diverse in terms of, of that type of diversity. We have people who have analytical skills, business skills, supply chain management skills, and they all work together to bring the best tools and processes to the team. And we have what we call a buddy system. So us four are gone today, somebody's covered and four is back at home because they, they understand the process and our, and our tools and our job. So that's what we've done over there. In the very bottom, I said detail customer knowledge. It goes back to my first slide. You have to know who your customer is, and you have to know who your, your industry is. And if you've got a, a, a commodity that you're doing for a customer, say you have 100 SKUs, as an example. You should be the smartest person in the, in the room on those 100 SKUs. Not the customer, not the end user. You should be the smartest one. So that's what we do with one of our process models. We'll, we'll show you that in a little bit. So we fixed the people problem. 
We've got processes that now are aligned. We have something we call the gate review. And what this does is, unless we've got authorization from a business unit to go spend millions of dollars, and we understand, say, say you're a customer, we're going to ask you, okay, what is it you're looking for? What's your budget? Your finance person may be sitting next to you. The engineering group, wherever it is, legal department, whatever you need. We don't get past that first gate that we even spend time working on that project until the whole committee approves and says, yeah, we've got budget, we've got funding. And that just turns us on to go now, go to gate B, from the gate A to gate B, to do our statement of work, RFP, develop all that. Then we come back to the same customer group and say, this is what we heard from your gate A. You get the thumbs up, now we go do our procurement pumps that we do well. And it's a complete gate process, right? So, and we have project management tools, you all know about those. Um, the bottom piece, it talks about a strategy process model. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So we're doing it really well in the people in the process. So now we're in the tool section. You know, we're looking for some good tools to do spend analysis, sourcing. And then when you talk about preferred suppliers, that to me is, is important, is a fourth thing in here. Uh, you can see our trend on supply base. We, we want valued suppliers. We want them to have the same <coughs> ethics. I think Howard talked about that, building relationships. It's very important because our customers rely on us to pick the right supplier to provide the product. And when you're talking about 3,100 plus flights a day and you have all these products coming in and you got a lot of products coming from China, you, you can't miss that boat. Or Chinese New Year comes up, you know, so, so it's a very complex thing. So we look for suppliers who, what we call preferred, build long-term relationships, and when they sign that contract, they're not done, and I'll show you that a little bit downstream. We ex expect them to do continuous lean improvement. So continuously showing how they're improving internally, and we may make a decision to resource them again, or we may just extend them based on their performance of helping our customers. And a lot of our suppliers are helping go green, bring green products to the company, on board the airplane, if you, if you fly US Airways, all the paper towels, components, we have a lot of green products. The recycle bags are green products, so we're trying to be environmentally friendly as we go as well. So we have a lot of initiatives like that going on. So let's talk about the, the, the tool piece of this. So how are we teaching that muster to change, and where are we, how are we getting there? So I talked about the first two. So where we, where we were is, we were a reactive organization. We weren't out in front of our customer. Our customers would call us and we'd have to react. We're very tactical in placing orders, pushing orders through. And the reason was that I said the customers didn't know who we were. They didn't involve us in upstream planning for what they were gonna spend throughout the year. So we had no idea. And a lot of times they'd throw it over the fence and say, you're inside lead time, we don't care, get us our product, right? Or we're gonna shut down the airplane. So we fixed all these things with the people. So we started on that. We started on the processes, getting all the, because we didn't have any standard processes. <laughs> Policy enforcement in a decentralized company is really hard. But now we have a big ally on our team, that's our CFO. He's seen all these things that can happen to save money. I think when I first got there, we did one of the Staples contracts. Our boss got to give the uh, CFO a check for $425,000 as a result of negotiating a five-year contract. That was a signing bonus that they provided to US Airways in addition to the rebate program for five years. And he's like, hey, this stuff works pretty good. Where's, where's more processes, right? And since then, Austin has saved millions of dollars and more of the groups have saved millions of dollars. And it's through a structured process model working with the supplier, win-win, where they're happy. Because our office supplies had to go compete with Office Max and Office Depot, but it was a, it was a fair contract. Right? So now what we're trying to do is to fix our tools problem. You know, as you've all heard today, when you don't have data, you, don't, you have limited visibility, how do you even develop a sourcing strategy if you don't have those tools, right? So we're just pushing orders, placing things, not thinking. So Asif might be buying the same product I'm buying, we just don't know about it, kind of thing. So we're trying to get that and get, get some tools that kind of tell us what's, what's going on. We have a lot of third party uh, contracts, so we have distributors that distribute a lot of our products. And they own some of the suppliers, but they have a markup when they handle those products, so there's no incentive to lock in long-term contracts with those suppliers. Well, we're pulling those out and put it into our strategy, so they don't get that continuous markup of the product. So we're just getting smarter as we go, but a lot of it's controlled by the data, by having the data. Um, we want to enable the business, which is what tools and things are about. So everybody's talked about the speed, 
Also, the, you, you talked about saving you know, two weeks, four weeks uh, doing our e-sourcing because everything is electronic, it's online. And think about it, I mean, coming from Boeing, doing one army contract would probably fill up this room, right? And now everything's being done electronically, you know? So think of the green environment, all the trees are saving along the way. Plus you're getting consistency, same procurement integrity, because everybody in the room who quoted, they're all getting the same message. And if somebody asks a question, that message goes out onto the e-form, and everybody gets to know what that question was. So, so it's fair all the way through, as well as the results. So we want to e-enable all everything we touch is one of our objectives. So what did we do? We teamed with Vicus, as I said, last uh, no, uh, August of 2011. Uh, we're working with them. And if I were to say we're still in the evolutionary stage, Austin talked about some of the challenges, but it's really the, the upfront part of this Zykus thing is getting to know what your requirements are, your bill of materials are, your cost accounting. What we're finding is our cost accounting, we, they're not tied to our data. So some of our data and spend doesn't match up. So we're finding those gaps. Now we can do a gap analysis and clean that up and work with our finance group. And our finance group will report to the, to the business <laughs> units. Once we negotiate contracts and let's say we do a two year, three year type contract, what happens is now we can come to you and say, when you do your budget forecasting, keep in mind we have all these contracts under under signature for the next three or four years with a price cap, so they know what their costs are going to be. It helps them plan better versus just okay, I'm going to add five percent here, ten percent there. So it's a really good tool to do those types of things. Okay, so August of, of uh, 2011 is when we started, and it starts off with doing. Uh, conducted an opportunity assessment, which is really looking internally within U.S. Airways, all the spend that's going on in the company and identifying where there's opportunities to put that into your strategy. And that's one of the things the tool's given us, because it bounces against our internal accounting systems. Uh, somebody talked earlier about contracts and how do you know you're capturing all the spend you need? Well, what you, like we have a P card spend, everybody get a purchasing card. We, have, we get a report that identifies who spent money on a P card, and we can tell if they spent money against a contract that we already have in place. Now we go to those business units or the, those customers and say, you just lost a lot of savings because you couldn't use this contract. Okay? So it's, it's, it's one of those ways you can get, get help there. So this is getting the opportunity, not only, not only in the contract and your spend, but also are there light commodities you can bring into your strategy. So you, we can take all of our bill of material and put them in category groups and put our strategy together that way. And even though there's another purchasing group that might be buying that, now we can go talk to them and say, hey, let's, let's team together and put together a contract that leverages all of these quantities and the spend across. Okay? But again, you can't do step one and two in profiling the commodities and the specification. Those, are, to me, are really hard steps. The Zycus tool really helps us get that data and analyze it and sort it out. But the hard, hard part in there is getting it from your customer. I mean, we have a lot of diverse customers. You ask them for the bill of material, what their specs are, and they just look at you. Like, well, we buy this stuff all the time. Okay, well, where is it? All right? So we have two requirements now. We're asking the customers to give us, um, through a gate process, which you sit down and you talk about what it is they're looking for. And we will ask them to provide us a bill of material, statement of work, usage levels, inventory levels in that gate process. If they don't do that, there's a sourcing document tool that we use, which pretty much provides the same thing at a lower dollar level, but we get as much information from the customer up front. And that's, how, that's what we use there. Now that's all been loaded into the Zycus tool, and now we can track cost centers, nominals, down to the detail level of our cost, and you can look at, look at who's spending, <coughs> spending reports, and you know it's a, it's a long process to clean up. Somebody mentioned earlier it takes a while to get that going. And the hardest part is loading that data, and then starting to figure out how you want to do the categorization of all the commodities you can buy. And you, as you get down to the categories, I'll show you coming up here on the slide. Then you can really you know, put your strategy out there as to how you want to go out and negotiate and which suppliers you want to use. And then the, the other uh, three through six gates are we, we then conduct a market analysis. Say we, we might find out that we have 42 suppliers today doing one type of category. We don't know if they're the right suppliers. So we'll go out and see where the market's going for that, that category of spend. 
and we'll, we'll change suppliers. We want to see who we're going to invite to the bidding party. So we, we may not have the right suppliers on board. Then we, we develop the commodity strategy, go through the RFP process, negotiation process, as you all know. And then the sixth, sixth step is, is just as important as managing the suppliers that you choose, that you've signed a contract with. And how we manage them is we put them on a scorecard, we do KPIs, key performance indicators, and we track them to the life of the contract that they're on. Whose scorecard do you use? We have, each one will have our own. It's our, our scorecard that is developed with you as our supplier. So if you look at a Staples, we have a five-year contract. You and I would set up with the parameters. I'll show you exact example of one in here. Okay? If you're a catering service company, it might be a different type of scorecard because the customer expectations might be different for catering than they are in office supplies. Okay? So we'll show that to you. Okay? And then a lot of our, our commodities are in different stages. And the other session that just had about a contract uh, management database, that is, that is very important to have one of those, which we don't today. Because now what you do, if you have a five-year contract, you need to know when you can do a setback of about a year or whatever lead time, so you can start your planning process all over with that supplier. So you need enough time to go look at the market, do market analysis again, and you need to go have time to go see if you're going to still invite them to be your partner or based on how they perform, or you're going to go out and go put it out for a bit again. So that's, that's another way you can do that. So that's our model that we follow at US Airways. So here's an actual uh, business unit. Uh, called aircraft appearance. This, these are the groups that when you board an airplane, go to the restrooms, you see your, your paper towels, your, your, your hand soaps, uh, the, the lab discs that are in there for the, for the uh, restrooms, uh, all the cleaning services. When a flight is switched out, the team comes on board and cleans out the airplane. If our plane is stationed overnight at a location, it's called a RON, Remain Overnight Airplane. It'll get a thorough cleaning, if you would. So that's kind of the aircraft appearance kind of role that they do some of their products. And so what we're trying to do is to show the, the managing director, we want to build them a sourcing strategy, we want to give them some customer metrics, and give them some scorecard metrics, because today they don't have those things. So we're using a real live example here. So the first thing we had to do was to go figure out what bill of material do they use, and you can see some of the simple things like trash bags, band-aids, dial soap, etc. So the top talks about the bill of material, the bottom talks about the type of statement of work, which is specs, unique things. There are some Boeing required specs, some Airbus required specs sometimes, FAA requirements, but things sometimes. So we want to know all that when we pull together their, their bill of material. We, we take this, this gets loaded into the Zykus tool. Now we can take the Zykus data and says for this particular customer, they have 132 SKUs of items, and we've categorized the Zykus tool, and now we've got eight categories that we can build a sourcing strategy around and using that tool. And what we also found is the one on the right, I mentioned earlier, one of our distributors, they were, they're doing the handling, and it turned out 33 of those 132 SKUs were handled by this, this distributor, which equated to 17 suppliers. They weren't focused on negotiating pricing with those suppliers because they get their little markup no matter what happens. And what happens to us is we get every month an increase from them that says, hey, this supplier's price went up. Okay, so we pay it and they get more money on their market. So we're pulling that out and that'll be built in as part of our strategy. So the 132 now become about eight category codes that the team will put together a strategy on, go out to the preferred suppliers you want to do an RFP on, and that helps build our sourcing strategy. Okay? Of the 132 of these SKUs, they turned out to be 42 suppliers. We didn't need 42 suppliers for this particular uh, company. So we have a goal to cut that supply base in half. We also were able to figure out what the budget was of spend. We went to our finance guy and got what they're forecasting for budget, and we saw that we had a gap. So now we were able to do a gap analysis to find out that some of our cost center numbers, some of the nominals against these bills of materials were wrong. So now we're trying to close that gap. Of the 42 suppliers, we only had 32% on contract, so which means we're well below what somebody showed earlier from Aberdeen, was it Richard, that said, hey, you want to be in the 80% range of, of your spend under contract? Well, we're far from that, but now that's a goal for us for aircraft insurance. Okay? So that, that's another uh, thing from the tool you can get. You start building your metrics and your data. So I talked about Staples, our office supplies company, a little bit. 
here's an example of a scorecard. And you mentioned the scorecard. So we, we decided on what these measures were going to be, what we're looking for, and we do have a rebate program with them, by the way. So for every dollar is spent, we, we, get, we reach a certain level, we get a re rebate check back from, from Staples. We have a fill rate, how, how often they fill. So this particular company has to deliver to 484 different locations around the domestic uh, country. And they have to be able to get into the airports where it's restricted access sometimes. Because they do two-day turnaround and all products ordered on an online tool that we have with their catalog price. And they, we get two-day turnaround. And they're doing a really, really good job. They're doing a lot of green products. They brought in the vendor show to show our customers what products they have that are green and it will help the environment. They helped us with a recycling program we call uh, through a company called TerraCycle. It's the pen you're holding, the markers, we recycle all those. And we get like two points of credit for every pen we recycle. So throughout all of our lo the key locations at US Airways, we have a recycle bin for all the markers, pens, everything gets reused, doesn't end up in a landfill. So those, uh -huh. Yeah, Staples and the, the, the co-sponsored company called TerraCycle. Yeah. Okay. And, but again, that's what, it, that's what a preferred supplier does. They help you continuously improve. They work with you on metrics. And what we do, we do a monthly tracking of the metrics. We bring their <coughs> vice presidents in on a quarterly basis and sit with them and see how the team's doing. Just because they have a five-year contract, we don't let them off the hook. We say, hey, this is continuous improvement, so let's talk about other things we can do to make value to our customers. So we do that religiously on a quarterly basis. And back to the tool on the bottom, which is our sourcing strategy. They're in the gate six, which means manage the supplier stage. But we've set back a year and says, hey, a year back in 4-1 of 2015, we're going to start re-looking at this contract again. And we're going to see how they perform. We'll see if we're going to compete them, or we're going to see if we're going to give them an extension because their performance has been really good, and they've added a lot of value to US Airways. But the key here is, again, it's about planning and tracking your supplier. It doesn't end because you signed the contract, and we have a setback as to when. It's no different than if you're going to renew a contract. You have a setback. It's what's the lead time to go out and redo an office supplies contract. It may be different with catering because it's domestic international. So each that's where about customer knowledge and knowing the commodity you deal with, know the lead times that are out there, what the suppliers can do. That'll determine your setback as to when you restart your strategy. So really, what is what is it all about for us? Okay, it's about delivering value to the customer. We have a term called chasm reduction, cost per available seat mile. So we're trying to reduce the cost of what cost to have you guys fly in an airplane, reduce that expense cost, and, and hopefully get a cheaper fare for you. So it's called chasm reduction for us. And in the end, it's about making profit for the company and the customer and, and the supplier to make it a win-win. That's really kind of what it's about. That's my story. Thank you. Hey, thank you for your time.